Thank you for tuning in to today's sermon. Uh, we're starting the subject of forgiveness, and today's sermon specifically is defining what forgiveness is and discussing forgiveness as a mandate. Hopefully you're able to find something of worth from this sermon. If you have any further questions about this sermon or any others, you can find more information about us at abfpdx.org. All right, so we're uh, continuing uh, the year of solidarity. Um, so in continuance of the year of solidarity, it just kind of makes sense if I'm going to follow the topic of conflict, we should probably talk about forgiveness. Kind of conflict often leads to a need for forgiveness. And it also just happens that this uh, month as we talk about forgiveness, uh, we also get to, uh, in a couple weeks here, celebrate Resurrection Sunday, which uh, shows us a, a perfect example of what forgiveness looks like uh, in an extreme way. Uh, when we think of forgiveness, uh, we typically focus our attention vertically, right, between God and us. Uh, but we don't often think about that horizontally between us and each other. So we're going to take opportunity to think of it that way. So instead of just talking about how God forgives our sins uh, because we repent, uh, we have the opportunity to be in full relationship with him. Uh, this is an act that he did out of his own grace. Uh, we're going to talk about how it is that we then put into practice how it is that we are in relationship with each other. How it is that we can stand strong together as a fellowship brought together in God's name. When we consider forgiveness, we're obviously quickly reminded that God's will for our lives is countercultural. The world doesn't think of forgiveness as, uh, as the, the status quo. It doesn't think of it as what happens regularly. I would just look at some of the, you know, probably some of your top movies that you, you love, right? A lot of time they feature the storyline of revenge. And we, we root for that to happen. Sometimes we even use the theory of revenge and that possibility to go the opposite way. We just watched with the outsiders uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance, right? The, I'm not spoiling anything, I hope. I mean, come on, it's been out for a while now. Um, but it, it has to do with somebody supposedly wanting vengeance for their brother. But it, that's kind of just the icing of the cake to, you know, cover over a nice gold theft, what have you. Um, those who love the world are enticed by the thought of some instant gratification, of personal retribution. I got mine today. I got what was coming to me. I made them pay for what they did. No, is that just my internal monologue? Is that? <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I've got, the, I've got the voice for radio, I guess, so it just brings that extra oomph to it, but I, that's how my head narrates things, okay? So forgiveness is not a first reaction, and it's not even something that we resort to as a last resort. Oh, I guess I just have to forgive, because there's no other options for revenge available for me. It's, uh, it's that, I don't know, kind of that feeling of, of power because you're holding a grudge, you're inflicting vengeance on somebody. It's, it's a pleasing thing almost to, to feel that power. You have wronged me and now I have power over you and I can control you however I wish to. In relationship, we often find ourselves craving that divisiveness because it fuels conflict and it elevates us into that position of power and dominance against those who have sinned against us. And we feel justified because they have caused an injustice against us. This is, the, this is what the world teaches, right? This is that whole, I gotta get mine uh, attitude. 
Uh, I gotta look out for me and me alone and anybody that gets in my way, I'm going to just run right over. I have to do what I have to do to protect myself and to get ahead. Either that or it's just because of where I work, I don't know. But that's what I come across on a regular basis. Uh, C.S. Lewis remarked that everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something that they themselves have to forgive for. So this gives us an idea that forgiveness is not something that just comes easily necessarily to us. It's against our basic human nature. In many ways, withholding forgiveness is more comfortable because forgiving others of their sins that they've committed against us brings us more uncertainty and a feeling almost of vulnerability. Because now I've opened myself up, I have forgiven you. Does that mean I'm going to allow you then to walk all over me because I have forgiven you of this? Where's my justice in that? Where's the judgment against you? How have you been made better because of what you did to me? How have you paid? We would rather bask in the misery, the bitterness, than to relinquish control. I want to hold on to that fear and anger. We hold on to that injustice and that spirit of revenging so that we can resolve and fulfill our own lives through other people's destruction because they have wronged us. We ask questions like, do I really have to forgive? Is forgiveness the same as forgetting? Do I have to forget what you've done to me? How do I forgive someone if they hurt me? How do I forgive someone if they've hurt someone else? Do I have a right to hold a grudge against someone because they've wronged someone I love? How do I know if they deserve forgiveness? What about justice? Where does justice fit in forgiveness? These are the kind of things that we ask ourselves, these are the kind of things that we need to know the answer to. Know this, that every one of us needs to understand and come to terms with the issue of forgiveness. It is part of God's plan, and properly understood, it bears witness to his justice. It does not contradict it. Forgiveness is a basic part of the plan that God has for all of us. We cannot live life that is bereft of forgiveness. It's not a compromise of morality. It's not a violation of justice in any way. And it's also not a way of avoiding conflict. I'll just forgive you so I don't have to deal with it. Forgiveness also is a mandate. Do you know that? It's a mandate. Something that we have to do. It's necessary for us to receive forgiveness, and it is necessary for us to give forgiveness. Without forgiveness, there is no solidarity in the family of God. Without forgiveness, we can never truly be together as one. If we are to be part of the family of God, there must be forgiveness. And this forgiveness is described in God's word. You're probably familiar with many of the areas in the New Testament that God talks about forgiveness. You maybe have read even some of the Old Testament stories and you've seen the forgiveness thread that's in those. And we'll take a look at some of those to determine what it is that we need to know about forgiveness. We're going to start today, though, by looking in the Word and understanding a good foundation of what forgiveness is. So we're going to look first in Matthew chapter 18, verses... 23 through 34. So this is probably something that you've heard before. I know it's ta- it was taught when I was in Sunday school. I don't know if I, I've, I've maybe heard it a couple of times, you know, in the, in the adult 
portion of church. But uh, <clears throat> Matthew eighteen twenty three through 34. Uh, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accountants up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him a million dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything that he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave the debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, and he grabbed him by the throat, and he demanded instant payment. This fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And then the king called him in, the man that he had forgiven, and said, You evil servant, I forgave you a tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. So the word in 27 that is translated in NLT to be released is the word uh, apalua, It literally means to let go or release, right, to release the debt. And then again in uh, 32, we have another word, uh, afami, to let go of. These are the Greek words that are used here to talk about this forgiveness. Now, it's talked about in a financial kind of way, right? This is Jesus... Uh, teaching in parable form. Forgiveness is a gift of the creditor. Right? Let's talk about it more in financial terms. He's the, it's the gift of the creditor. Creditors are not said to forgive debts when they are paid. If you pay a debt, you've paid in full. The debt is not forgiven because you've paid in full. The debt is paid in full. To forgive a debt is to discharge the debt, even though it has not been paid. Though you have not paid us, I'm going to write that off. It's it's taken care of. You no longer owe me this money. It's to expunge the debt, to cancel the debt. It is no longer there. What about, uh, let's say you were indebted to me. How about, what if one of you were to come up and to take my super expensive Chromebook? That's a joke because Chromebooks are not that expensive. But if you were to take this Chromebook and you were to smash it on the ground, and I would say to you, I forgive you. Just give me $400 and I'll go grab me a new one. Is that forgiveness? I forgive you, just give me 400 bucks, I'll go grab a new one. The answer is no, right? That's not forgiveness. Because I am still requiring payment. Now with that said, this thing's pretty indestructible. I mean, and it's not worth 400 bucks. The truth would be that I would not have forgiven you because I am making you pay. My words ring hollow and empty. I'm expecting to be paid in full, and I have not truly forgiven you, though I said I had. 
Usually when we say we forgive, it's really, I'm not going to release my fury on you right now. I want to punch you so bad. I'm not going to blow up at you, though. I'm just going to withhold my wrath. But look out. I'm going to punish you in different ways. <laughs> I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to speak to you anymore. You ever heard of the silent treatment? No, because it's quiet. I'm not going to give you the attention or the time that I normally would. I'm not going to spend time with you anymore. You will feel the loss of having all the glory that is James around you. And you will be less for it. You're not forgiving if you have that attitude. That is not forgiveness. You're being punitive. You're being judgmental. You are elevating yourself to the status of judge, jury, and executioner. Punishing them, making them pay for the offense, no matter how great or small that it is. That's not forgiveness, people. And it's not your place. To forgive is to take someone that you have been holding in your debt, to take those who have sinned against you, to take that bitterness and resentment that you would feel towards them, to take the, you better be glad, I'm not going to give you what's coming to you attitude and let go of it. Right? The example in Matthew here literally means to release. That means you are holding on to it and you need to let go of it. If you do not let go of it, if you do not release it, if you harbor it and you cling to those things, all you're doing is poisoning your soul. You are commanded to forgive. If someone sins against you and you do not forgive, you, ironically, are now the one who is sinning. But you're not sinning against them. You're sinning against God. You may feel justified, but it is sin nonetheless. When you do not forgive a fellow believer, what you are saying is, I, I know Jesus died on the cross for you, um, but that's not enough. It's not enough for me. I know Jesus died on the cross for you, but forgiveness is going to take the death of Jesus plus my silent treatment. That will be true justice then. It takes the cross and me ignoring you and not spending time with you and withholding my family from you. It takes the cross and me withholding relationship from you. And that's just the nice forms of revenge. Now you'll notice that I did say specifically a fellow believer. So that must mean that it's okay to not forgive unbelievers, right? No. Because if they're not a believer, what you're saying is God's wrath is not enough. 
Only God's wrath plus my punishment will even things out. Yes, in order to pay what's due, you need an eternity in hell plus I will not accept your phone calls. That will teach you. This is not forgiveness. This is not the right answer. This is also kind of messed up, because by holding on to that unforgiveness, you're not really hurting them. They're not really suffering any penalty. If anything, you're the one that's suffering in that. Not only is your relationship with them not repaired, but your relationship with God is marred by the bitterness and hate that you are holding on to. It is very important to make sure that you allow for a right relationship with others so that you may have a right relationship with God. It is necessary for you to forgive your brothers and sisters before you come before the Lord. Jesus states in Matthew 5, verse 23, in 523 he says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, you leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person. Then, then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. So before coming to God with your sacrifice, you reconcile with your brother. In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, verse 12, what does it say? And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Some translations even say, forgive us our debt as we have forgiven our debtors. Continuing in Matthew 6, Jesus says after that Lord's Prayer, in verses 14 through 15, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And even if we go back to where we were in Matthew 18, after listening to the story of the talents that were forgiven, of the debt that was owed. In 18, starting in 32 through 35, just as a reminder, right? He calls him back in, 32. Then the king called in a man who he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow student or servant just as you had mercy on me, or I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. Jesus follows that up with, that's what the heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. There's a mandate here. There's a call to action. There's a necessity to forgive others, to get ourselves in re the right relationship that we should have with others, to, to be in true fellowship without a trace or harbor of any type of resentment or bitterness towards one another. That means we're probably going to be forgiving each other a lot. Like some of us, even like on a daily basis, right? Reconcile your source, yourselves with your brother and sister before you come before your father. You see, what happens is when we hold on to these feelings of being wronged, and instead of forgiving, we turn our focus inward and think of some type of justice for ourselves... What we're really doing is cutting ourselves off from the love that God has poured into us. 
We are cutting ourselves off from God. We're not allowing ourselves to have a right relationship with God. We are denying his love that is so great that we cannot contain it. And we're trying to stop it from flowing through us to our brothers and sisters. This is not how the body acts. This is not how we become one in mind, body, and spirit. This is not how we fellowship with one another. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, you're all familiar with that, right? 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says in verses 4 through 7, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. When Paul is writing here in context of how the body is supposed to work together, In 12, he's talking about how the body works together with the spiritual gifts, making sure that the body is equipped for everything that is needed. And then he follows it up with this description of love. This description of love that cannot be contained, that should be present whenever we are gathered together. How will they know that we are Christians? by our love for one another. There's no room for us to poison ourselves towards one another and allow bitterness to be our driving force. We cannot work together in solidarity if we hold ourselves in that state of bitterness because it rots us from the inside. And it puts a barrier between me and you. I cannot fully be in fellowship with you because I can't forgive you for what you have done to me. There can be no peace in the body. This breaking point comes about in our relationships when we put ourselves in the judgment seat. And we say that we have the power that belongs only to God. We somehow think that we are the ones that can act his justice. But guess what? We're not equipped for that. We're not equipped for it. We don't have the right to take it from God, and quite honestly, it's a responsibility that we cannot handle without destroying ourselves. We cannot bear the weight. We can't bear the weight of his judgment against us, let alone judging other people. Praise God we have his grace. Do not hold on to those things because they do not belong to you. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, it says if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. Does that get through to you? Did 
you understand the gravity? The gravity of that statement is literally that you will not have eternal life because you hate your brother or sister. Because your hate is not allowing God's love to flow from him through you in relationship with your brother and sister. Colossians 3.13 says that we are to make allowance for each other's faults. It says that we are to forgive anyone who offends you. And remember, the Lord forgave you, so you should forgive others. It's exactly the story that Jesus told in Matthew 18 that we read at the beginning. But be aware. Forgiveness looks a certain way. Forgiveness is not ignoring a sin that was committed against you. Forgiveness is not forgetting that a wrong was done. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. But there must be forgiveness for reconciliation to take place. Forgiveness is not a feeling. I feel like I forgive you. Forgiveness doesn't require an apology or need for someone to become deserving of it. Forgiveness is not easy. But most important, forgiveness is not optional. Forgiveness at its foundation is a decision that you make to refuse to live in the past. A conscious choice to release others from the debt of their sin against you so that you can be set free. So that you can be healed. It doesn't deny the pain. It doesn't change the past. But it breaks a cycle. It breaks a cycle of bitterness that binds you to those wounds. Forgiveness allows you to move on, to grow healthy. You can forgive even when other people make no confession. Did Jesus say on the cross, forgive them as soon as they say they're sorry? He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is a gift that is freely given, and it cannot be earned. You can forgive, and the other person may not even know that you have done this. We must rediscover the humanity of the person who hurt us. We admit that they are sinners, and we recognize that we are sinners too. We surrender our right that we think that we have to get even. And this is hard because it's kind of natural for us to want someone to pay for the pain that they have caused us. But in the end, do we take judgment on ourselves? No. We leave judgment in the hands of God because only he can bear the weight of that. We give up our hatred and we let go of bitterness 
and we put into action the words of Jesus. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as a true child of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both evil and good, and he sends rain on the just and unjust alike. And if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? For even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. You'll know that you've been able to achieve forgiveness when you are able to ask God to bless those who have hurt you. Stop carrying around the weight of other people's sins. Jesus took that weight for them and for you. It is not your burden, and you cannot bear it. I want to make you understand something. Today is not a complete treatise on every aspect of forgiveness. I don't think that we have enough time for that. What today is, is a beginning of a journey to understand more fully what forgiveness is. And it starts with understanding that forgiveness is, first and foremost, a mandate. It must take place. And forgiveness is a release. That means you're not holding on to even the smallest nugget. We're going to take opportunity in the next coming weeks to talk about some different aspects of forgiveness, but we're going to end today with a better understanding of what it is and what it is not. We know more about the difficulties and the importance, and prayerfully, we have an understanding of the necessity of forgiveness. It is crucial for it to take place. Now, I do have some questions for you, but before we go to questions, we also have opportunity to celebrate a true example of forgiveness that took place for us through communion. So let's go ahead and quiet our hearts and think about what has taken place that we would celebrate the blood of our Savior and the body of our Savior being spilled and broken for us. I do have some questions for you to ponder as we go to our discussion times. So the first question I have for you is uh, how has forgiveness impacted your relationship with those who have forgiven you? How has forgiveness impacted your relationship with those that you have been forgiven by? Uh, second question is, how has forgiveness impacted your relationships with those that you have forgave, or that you forgave? And then how have you struggled with forgiving someone? And then lastly, what consequences have you had to deal with because you did not forgive someone? What are the consequences that you've dealt with when not forgiving someone.